Welcome to the Portfolio Playbook, presented by Flex Networks, which is modernizing, simplifying, and revolutionizing the engagement experience between asset managers, wealth managers, and financial advisors. In each episode, we'll bring you valuable insights and perspectives from an array of key players in financial services and technology, including the ones you know already and the ones you should get to know. Tune in to hear what drives these firms as they create compelling offerings for today's markets. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Portfolio Playbook. I'm Rich Miller with Flex Networks. And I'm pleased to welcome my guests today from Bristol Gate Capital Partners. Joining me is Mike Kapombasis, President and Chair of the Bristol Gate Investment Committee, and Poria Ferdosi, Chief Data Scientist with Bristol Gate. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Rich, it's great to be with you and excellent pronunciations on two difficult names. So well done. <laughs> Let's get started. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about your background? And what brought you to Bristol Gate? Sure. For the better part of 20 plus years, I was on, quote unquote, the sell side in the institutional equity business and at both a large Canadian bank and at a large U.S. bank, both in New York and in Toronto. And about 10 years ago, when it was clearly time for me to move on to the next phase of my professional journey, I was looking around for my next gig, so to speak. And I was introduced to Richard Hamm, who's one of our co-founders and our current CEO, by a mutual friend. And we agreed to meet over breakfast one morning for an hour at a, actually a little place near the office here in Toronto. It's a little bagel place called Kivas, which is a part of the folklore of, of this place. And so we met over breakfast one morning, and that breakfast lasted well over three hours. We just got to talk about the business, about the, the opportunities, about what Bristol Gate was doing. And I really believe that the firm had lots of potential to be a world-class investment boutique. What I loved about the firm and the two co-founders is they led with a U.S. product. So that's a little unusual for a Canadian-based firm to lead with a U.S. product and benchmarked against the S&P 500, which is the most difficult benchmark to beat. And so at that point, they had a five-year track record and they were running this dividend growth strategy in a very unique and interesting manner. And I thought that I could help grow the business, especially in the United States where I had lots of contacts. And so, you know, as you know about U.S. equities, the addressable market is the world. Essentially, everybody has to own them. And so I thought that this could be a wonderful next chapter for me, something more entrepreneurial coming to a, a boutique from a big firm. And so that was the kind of the genesis of my of my start at the firm, which has been about nine years now. And how about you, Poria? How did you get to Bristol Gate? Yeah, my path to Bristol Gate, I guess, is quite different from the path that Mike took, for sure. My background is engineering, and I've been engineering work, engineering consulting work for a while. The first time that I met Richard was was back to got back to 2015, uh, if I'm not making a mistake. Yeah, I got introduced to Richard and the other founder back then, Peter, through a mutual friend, and it was quite interesting. I was looking for a field that I can apply almost all my technical knowledge and background essentially there. And I realized that finance is the best place to be. You know, before then, I was going to sites, collecting data, cleaning data myself. And I was trying to find a field that, well, the data available to me at least. And I thought even back then that the data is clean and there's not much that I need to do. So finance was a perfect word for me. However, the grass is not necessarily greener on the other side all the time. The cleaning is something that we always need to do. I know joined Bristol Gate back in 2017. I've been with Bristol Gate for more than six years now. Great. Thank you. Mike, when you're not in the office, you know, what gets you amped up? That's a good question. I would say outside of the office, I mean, I have you know, wife and three kids. So outside of family commitments, et cetera, my passion is is actually racket sports. And so I love to play anything with a racket that's involved. And so I play tennis, I play squash, I play actual pickleball now, which is taking the world by a storm. And I play platform tennis and something called padel, which has been imported to parts of North America now from Spain. Playing games, playing racket sports for somebody my age helps keep me as young as I can be. And it's something that I love to do. And so that's kind of my a big part of, of my interest outside of the office. 
Uh, any lessons learned in investments that apply on the pickleball court or vice versa? Don't overdo it and overreach because you'll get hurt from a physical standpoint and from an investment standpoint. <laughs> Yeah, how about you when you're outside the office? I run a lot. I've been running for a while and getting to long distance running almost in 15 years now. And more recently, I'm I'm rowing on the water, joining different rowing clubs. One rowing club, actually, and I row and races in different regattas. So I enjoy running. It's give me peace, for sure. It's a solo activity. On the flip side, rowing is a group activity, and I, and I love to be be the team to compete and go to the regardless. Any parallels, team activity in rowing and investments? Yeah, the beauty of rowing is that you row in a boat, so you have to row together. You need to be consistent in what you do and go through the challenges together in one boat. You learn to row or you learn to essentially leave, I would say. So... The consistency is the most most important component that I, that I learned through the rowing practices I'm doing. Excellent. So it's clear you both have very different backgrounds. You know, we'll start with Mike. You know, you came up through the industry. What got you into investments in the first place? So as I said, I spent over two decades on the sell side in the institutional equity business. And over that period, I had really the privilege of working with some of the some of the best asset management firms from around the world. And I had a front row seat to a certain extent to dozens of both good and not so good investment managers. And for my seat to, to best serve those clients, I needed to have a deep knowledge of their respective investment processes. It's hard to sell to somebody if you don't understand how they manage money. And so I had some exposure to some very good firms and the best ones all had something in common. They had a proven, durable, repeatable investment process. And that was pretty consistent across the geographies where I had exposure to these managers. And so when I was introduced to Bristol Gate back almost 10 years ago, I was quickly drawn to their investment process. I was a big believer in dividend growth investing from my previous life, understanding why it's a really good place to have some exposure in the equity markets too. And so the Bristol Gate had all the characteristics that I highlighted in terms of it was proven, durable, repeatable, but it was also truly distinct. And in a competitive landscape, certainly in the dividend space, in a very competitive landscape, that is a big plus. And Boria, big uh, difference between engineering and investments. What got you into the investment side of the world? Yeah, so the investments got into the, to that essentially through one of the courses when I was doing my PhD back in 2010. I got a financial engineering course for the first time, got introduced to portfolio optimizations and black shore models. And I thought, okay, this is amazing. My background is applied math and computational fluid dynamics. Everything matches perfectly. So I can use all my knowledge and what I've learned in the years I've been studying into finance then. I started seeking different opportunities, learning more about finance. However, back then I decided to pursue my career in engineering till I fully understand what I want to do next. So that is the most important question that I try to get an answer for and the true passion. And I realized that, of course, I want to I wanna focus on what I've been doing, developing codes, going through problems and try to address them mathematically. When I came across Bristol Gate, what I found very interesting is that instead of focusing on playing specifically with returns, forecasting some stuff that have some sort of random nature, the, they have a governing equation, I would say. The governing equation is essentially the cash flow statements, balance sheets, all those statements that they, we, they're using from fundamental perspective are like governing equation in physics and mechanical engineering. So again, it's a perfect situation for me, is essentially that I can apply all those techniques and all those knowledge that I learned before in, in through engineering, essentially, and apply it in finance. And uh, yeah, since then, I've been working on all these type of equations and predictions and developing models here and there, which is quite interesting and fascinating for me. Quite a change from engineering. Yeah, for sure, by all means. So, Mike, thinking about what Bristolgate offers, who is your ideal client? What type of advisor and client is the perfect fit for Bristol? That's a good question. So we really try hard to 
ensure that we are aligned with our advisors, investors in terms of the, our objectives. And, and so for me, the ideal client or advisor for us, first and foremost, believes in our investment philosophy and the benefits in our case of high quality organic dividend growth. They really have to believe in that those types of companies are a good place for to have some exposure in terms of the equity markets. I think it's fair to say they also understand that no strategy, however good it is, beats the market every year. But over time, good strategies produce very competitive risk adjusted returns relative to the market. And so that that is important in terms of from a client's perspective. Ultimately, we want clients to believe in our value proposition and it does work over time. It doesn't work every time. And it's not a be all to end all solution. We recognize that what we do is a piece of that asset mix, a piece of that equity pie. And in combination with other strategies that produces really good outcomes for clients. And so our job is to consistently confirm, I suppose, an investor's trust in us by managing the way that we've been hired to manage and in the right way for them in terms of how we produce the how we manage this high dividend growth portfolio. And it's no surprise there's a big focus on shorter time periods. It seems like attention spans and focuses get shorter and shorter over time. What do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing the industry today? As an active manager, as a boutique active manager, like all of the participants in the space, we've seen fee compression across the businesses, you know, equity, fixed income, et cetera. And so that, that is something that we're all dealing with. Also, active management has been challenged because of the huge growth in passive. And let's face it, the majority of active managers over the long term have failed to outperform their respective indexes on a risk adjusted basis. And so that is a huge challenge for the industry as a whole. And a part of the reason we've seen this fee compression. And so I would highlight that. But, you know, I also think that there is ample evidence to suggest that there's a subset of managers who I would say share similar traits that tend to buck this trend and deliver attractive long term results for their clients and tend to have success in the active management space. And those traits include high active share, which is, you know, how different you are than the market. The best way to beat the market is to look different than the market. And so, you know, we run two concentrated portfolios, a disciplined approach to the investment process, which is what we've had for over 14 years. And I think critically, a longer term outlook. You have to be able to look at performance through market cycles. Obviously, we all look at it through a one and three and five year time frames, but I think it's also critical to look at it through longer term outlooks, et cetera. And Every successful active manager in the market, big or small, that have been around for a long time will have challenging periods, whether it's a three-year challenging period or five or even a 10, et cetera. And so that's not unusual, but over time, they will add value. For you. Yeah, to just add on top of that, what on top of what Mike said, of course, AI is, is a new challenge for everything and finance is not excluded either. So we keep hearing about chat GPT these days and uh, with various evolution of that, there are lots of opportunities and capabilities that we can benefit from, of course. And it, it would be a, it would be a disruptor technology, not necessarily chat GPT, but the technology just to give you an idea. But with the help of these models, in large language models, we can summarize all these earnings call and transcripts, any text based material essentially very easy. Summarization is an easy job and most of these models can do lots of heavy work for us up front. However, on the flip side, the users of these models need to know exactly what they are trying to get out of these models. Just give you an example here on the engineering side. With the development of lots of engineering tools back in 1990s and 1980s, I would say, there were companies that hiring people and said that, okay, this is the software. With the use of this software, of course, you can design buildings and houses and platforms, however you want to frame it. However, if the user doesn't know exactly what to ask and what to do with these, with these software and the model, the end result would be very destructive, actually. It can be very dangerous. So the educational side of these systems, of course, is, is quite important. We need to know what we ask, we need to know what we're looking for, and we should not just simply rely on the AI model to throw some numbers to us or some answers to us. 
The way that we worked at Bristol Gate and to mitigate some of these risks, I would say, from AI perspective, is that what we do has a human component there. So with the help of our human side of a fundamentalist, essentially, we are trying to manage this type of risk. At the same time, because we've been developing our models for quite a long time, we stay on top of the technologies and we improve on different aspects and we understand what we do. And the same is true when we try to hire for a firm. We, we want to make sure that those people that join us have both skill sets. They have a financial understanding as well as data science and analytical tool that they need to be equipped with. Got it. Very important that they can wield the tools correctly. And the big assumption underneath is that there's great data going into all of the models exactly. that you're running. Correct. Right. Let's pivot out Bristol Gate specifically to start. You're Canadian based in Toronto. You know, what are some of the benefits of your location? Well, I would say we are certainly proud Canadians. And so we think being in Canada just from that point alone is helpful. Toronto itself is a big city. It's the biggest city in Canada. It is a diverse, multicultural city. In fact, if it was in the United States, it would be the fourth biggest city after New York. Los Angeles and Chicago. So it's a big city. It is also a center for AI around the world, and it has been for a while now. And so it's a diverse, multicultural city. It has wonderful colleges and universities in the city. It's got a deep financial services industry as well. So there's a deep talent pool for us to to hire folks across the organization. So we're very, we feel very lucky to be based in Toronto. It is on the doorstep of the United States. It's right next to Buffalo and near Detroit. So it's very easy for us to travel anywhere in the United States to see our clients. And you know, we've been SEC registered since 2015. So we have been doing business in the United States for a long time now. It actually makes us kind of unique in Canada. There's very few investment management firms in the in in Canada doing business in the U.S. And so, you know, little Bristol Gate, I say little, even though we're close to $3 billion in assets under management. We're one of the very few firms in Canada that's making an impact in the United States. We're very proud of that. And we're also proud that we're based in Toronto. We think our own minds are an advantage. You know, we have University of Toronto here. We have godfather of AI, AI, of course. Jeffrey Hinton is here in the University of Toronto. There are lots of talents available to us. We have Vector Institute here in Toronto to which we can have access to a pool of talents that is literally next door to us. It's pretty close to us. We can go and talk to different experts in the field. And if we need any opinion or, or any help, we can just talk to these experts. Hey, this is Brian Moran, the CEO and founder of Flex Networks. Thank you for listening to the Portfolio Playbook. If you have any questions about a manager or firm featured on the show or about Flex's platform, please head over to www.flxnetworks.com or take a look at the show notes to find out how to reach me and my team. We would love to hear from you. Mike, you mentioned the the focus of Bristol Gate on the U.S. market is one differentiator relative to other Canadian investment firms. What would you say are some of the key differentiators that set Bristol Gate apart overall? It's a good question. I would say, so, so we're not a supermarket. We are specialists in the market. So we don't build products to fill a gap in the shelf, so to speak. We build products where we believe we have a competitive advantage and we believe we have a competitive advantage in high dividend growth. And so we're also committed to direct alignment with our investors. So we're, as you know, we're an independent employee-owned firm with our own personal capital invested alongside our investors and on the same terms in the strategy and the two strategies that we run. So I think by being consistently invested alongside our investors, we will always be committed to sharing the future with them, which we think really resonates with who we do business with. And we're also you know, big believers in active management and in creating what we call a behavioral edge. And so this has been a longstanding reason for Bristol Gates' adoption of technology since the beginning as a core element of our investment process. I mean, technology leads us to a more defined systematic process where we try to, if not eliminate, minimize human biases and emotions that can often get active managers into trouble and impair their ability to make sound judgments. And at the same time, you know, we differ from what I would say, you know, true quantitative strategies or quant firms by really promoting this hybrid 
human and machine approach to our high dividend growth strategies. And so this really allows us to corroborate the quantitative process with fundamentals and judgment by the fundamental team. And so when you add, when you kind of add that all up, you know, we are a different looking type of firm relative to most active managers and even to boutique and investment managers. And Poria, what would you see as the as the biggest differentiators of Bristol Gate? The way that I look at it is that at the very beginning, when there was hype, when the hype around AI was much higher than what we observe now, of course, yeah, ChatGPT created a new new wave. But prior to then, there were lots of discussions about quant only strategies or fundamental or traditional fundamental only strategies. Lots of head to head discussions and heated discussions among these two groups. What I like about Bristol Gate is their hybrid approach, hybrid model that we have. We do not just blindly, I would say, go through a quant- quantitative model and accept all the outputs of it. We want to make sure that there is a overlay there, human overlay essentially there, to make sure that what we do is in line with what we think is, what the model predicts essentially is in line with what the human thinks is. So that, that's how I look at the firm. It's the great differentiator from my perspective. I would like to dig a little bit more into the AI aspect. AI has certainly been a very popular topic across industries everywhere. Bristlegate incorporated AI and machine learning into your investment process very early on. And I'm wondering, Poria, if you could tell us a little bit more about the role that AI plays as part of your overall process and how you work with the more traditional side of the house. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Specifically, when human involved, things get a little bit challenging. So from the get go, when the firm established by the founders, they both lived into evidence based approach which means that we cannot just go through hypothesis and some theories that we have in our mind without testing. So there are lots of analytical work that was done up front then. And even from the get-go, we had, we've been, I would call it an early adapter of the technology. We have, we have been using quantitative approach. We had a machine learning model, very simple one back then. However, by the evolution of technology, the model improved as well. You know, you got to the different versions of the model and now we have We have a most advanced version of it, which is called gradient boosting tree models, essentially. Now, one aspect that is very important in in the development of all these models and technologies, essentially in the field of AI, is the build of confidence. And the relationship between the human and machine is very similar to a relationship between, I would say, parents and child. At some point, you start teaching the child and you get to a point that, okay, you can rely on whatever your child, not necessarily whatever, but some of the stuff that you receive from your kids. So the training gets into a new level, new era, which is two-way approach, essentially. And machine learning model is not any different. Through lots of evaluations and explainabilities that we do, we try to explain the outcome of the models to the human counterpart that we have here in the firm. And we build that relationship, we build the confidence. And now we are at the point that the human side are okay and happy actually to accept more insight and even more out of box ideas from the model and do their, do their work there. Having said that, of course, this needs time. And the luxury that we have here is that the founders was the early adopters of this technology. The, the fact that we got into this field way ahead of time and we adopt this technology and build this relationship and increase the confidence helps us a lot to basically go over some of these challenges that we have. So now we have a kid who we can listen to. <laughs> We're actually all children of the data science team. I'm one of the oldest children at the company. Looking at the interaction of the human element and the AI element, from your perspective, have you seen lessons along the way, lessons learned that have helped evolve the process and look at things perhaps a bit differently? What I would say is that before I came to Bristol Gate, I would just understood the fundamental side of the business. And since I've been at the firm, I have seen the benefits of both the fundamental and quantitative team working closely together. So there's no Chinese wall or separation between the teams. They really do work collaboratively together and they can challenge each other. They can push back. 
And so I've seen the benefits of that. And again, it's very unique, I would say, certainly in the, in the active dividend space, having a world-class data science team work, you know, hand in hand with a very strong fundamental team. And so I see the benefits of it. I know how it, it helps us as a firm to run a better a dividend growth strategy. And I, I would say with respect to um, to fit or people at the firm, you know, we have 19 people at Bristol Gate and every seat is really valuable and you want to get it right on every seat. Now, over time, we haven't got it always right, but eventually we have. And I would say right now we have, in my humble opinion, all those 19 seats filled appropriately with the right high quality person. And that's, I guess, another side of the story at a boutique firm where you're doing something differentiated and in the market. And, you know, having that right person in the right seat is is a challenge for any firm. And and it's, I would say for boutiques, it's even more important because unlike big firms where if I don't work well with someone three floors up, they're three floors up and I'm not going to see them unless I run into them in the elevator getting a coffee. At boutiques, it's that's really important in terms of the culture, the fit, and maximizing the value of each and every seat. And I feel, you know, I've been here the second longest, and I feel that we are in the best position we've ever been in, in that regard. Taking a look, let's bring it together with the, the team, fundamental side of the house, the AI side of the house, and let's take a look at the Bristol Gate U.S. equity strategy specifically and how the pieces work together. So Bristol Gate, we've said, it runs a very differentiated dividend growth strategy. And not only is it differentiated, it works. I mean, it's good to be differentiated, but if it doesn't work, it's not so good. <laughs> and as I mentioned, the beginning of the conversation is a big reason why I came to the firm, because we have this really innovative, we call it a modern approach to a timeless evergreen investment strategy in dividend growth investing. And so first and foremost, the strategy is concentrated high dividend growth strategy, and that alone, believe it or not, is different. So dividend growth is anything above zero. Now, we're a high dividend growth strategy, and we have delivered a little over 19% annual dividend growth annually for 14 years. And so we, when we say we're high dividend growth, we mean it. We're also yield agnostic, which is another feature that makes us very different. The vast majority, I would say 99 out of 100 dividend and dividend growth strategies start with the premise that of we want higher than market yield and then we'll either look for something else, quality or dividend growth or whatever it is. So we are yield agnostic. We're simply looking for the highest dividend growth looking forward at the highest quality. And what that does is it allows us to build a high yield on what we call original cost looking three and five years out. So building that high yield on original cost is how I believe a, big, a good way to sort of create and preserve wealth in, in the stock market. And then, as Puri said, we do so using this hybrid investment process where we incorporate AI and machine learning, data science with good old-fashioned fundamental analysis and research. And so I would say our strategies, our two strategies are re ideal pairs for other good strategies in the market, whether those are conventional dividend strategies, conventional income strategies, or large cap growth strategies you know, that basically own a lot of stocks that don't pay dividends. So our products as a specialist in the market, as I mentioned earlier as well, so we are really good pair or complement to a lot of the good conventional product in the market. And frankly, in a nutshell, that's how we're growing as a firm. Okay, now let's take a look ahead. You know, clearly the industry is undergoing tremendous change, as you mentioned earlier. As you look ahead a few years or even further down the line, how do you see the industry evolving? I would say that over time, and we've seen this for the last 10 years, but I think it will continue this way. Over time, the, I think the biggest players in the industry will continue to leverage their uh, their size, their cost base, their capital positions to, to outcompete the big but smaller firms in the industry. And then on the other hand of the of the spectrum, I believe that employee-owned, actively managed boutiques that are essentially specialists in certain sub-segments of the market that have, as I mentioned earlier, proven, durable, repeatable investment processes will continue to do well. 
And I think more importantly for all players, I think, you know, investment managers that embrace technology, not just in their investment process, but throughout their organizations will emerge not only as survivors, but as, as winners and, and beneficiaries of the growth of the business going forward. So that, that would be my view, and I'll pass it to Poria. Yeah, so the way that I look at it, again, would be, of course, from the AI lens, artificial intelligence lens and the machine learning side perspective. There are lots of developments happening there, of course. People become efficient if they adopt the technology. And because of that, the market will be more efficient. So there would be more efficiencies through the market. People, you know, the arbitrage opportunities would be, would be shrunken more and more. And it's, it wouldn't be as easy necessarily to generate output unless, of course, you, you have, you adapt the technology. I frame it once like this, that people or human with artificial intelligence in future will beat human without artificial intelligence. So in other words, the combination of HI and AI, human intelligence and artificial intelligence, will beat just HI, human intelligence on its own. And do you see, as you look forward, more firms adopting AI? And do you feel that you've got the clearly Bristolgate had a head start in utilizing it as part of your process what do you see on that side for the rest yeah. of the industry? Yeah, so the more and more people are starting adopting the technology and they, they need to, of course, do lots of investment now. It's not easy to develop the infrastructure for some of these complicated models. More and more, of course, companies are going to use the technology and embrace it. With the help of that, they try to generate more value for the clients and for the customers. One thing that needs to be done better, I would say, or focus more, is that the just predicting return is not necessarily what companies and may need to focus on. We just focus on dividend growth. We think that by predicting fastest dividend growers, we can generate alpha and more value for our customers and clients. And I would just add that, you know, we have been using technology, data science, and machine learning since the beginning, it's part of our DNA and it's completely you know, woven into the fabric of this firm and certainly in our investment process. I do feel a lot of active managers feel pressure to adopt technology and even now AI, that's, that's the language they're using, into their business as just because they feel that they need to. But until you define how you're going to do it and how it benefits your firm and your value proposition, that's the big challenge. And, you know, just hiring a kid out of uh, engineering school and, and sticking him in the corner and, and giving him a couple little pet projects is not really adopting AI into your business as an asset manager. But I think everyone feels pressure to do that, given the kind of this digital world that we live in, this, this kind of AI world that we live in. Fortunately, you know, we, as I said, it's part of who we are, a part of what we do integral part of who we are and what we do. And so it's just a natural, it's natural for us. I don't know that it's natural for a lot of other folks right now. It needs to be for them. So we'll have to work through those those, those challenges, et cetera. But I think everybody feels, not just in our industry, but across all industries, having some kind of AI literacy is important going forward. I think we can all agree on that. Every firm is going to have to come to grips with how what that means and how they use it going forward. I'm just lucky that we have, you know, 14, 15 year head start <laughs> in adopting technology the way that we have, because it, it doesn't feel like it's sending force. It's just, as I said, it's part of our fabric and DNA. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, it certainly sounds like there are tremendous opportunities ahead and that Bristol Gate is very well positioned. Mike and Poria, thank you for joining us today. Thank this you for having a- us. We love being with you and getting to talk about the firm and what we do and all the great people here. Likewise, yeah. Thank you. It's amazing talking to you and pass you some of our thoughts and thinking about the process and the future of some of these technological developments. Great. Thank you. Well, I I thought it was a great conversation. And thank you to our listeners as well. Thank you for joining us for the Portfolio Playbook. We'll see you again soon. Thanks and be well. Thank you for joining us on the Portfolio Playbook, where we bring you the latest insights and analysis from top firms in the financial and tech industry. We hope you found this episode informative and valuable in helping you better understand the strategies and approaches of these firms. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to tune into our next episode for even more insights and perspectives from leading industry experts. 
For questions or to join Flex for free, please visit our website at www.flexnetworks.com and don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information contained in this recording is provided as is for educational and informational purposes only and should not serve as the basis for any trading or investing decisions. Flex Networks makes no representations and disclaims all express, implied, and statutory warranties of any kind to any viewer, listener, or other third party. Neither Flex Networks nor any of its affiliates make any endorsement of any particular company, security, product, or financial strategy, and nothing contained in this recording should be construed as investment advice. Investors should undertake their own due diligence and carefully evaluate companies before investing. Flex Networks is a promoter, as defined by the marketing rule, Rule 2064-1, under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940, of the investment products contained herein. For such promotion, Flex Networks is compensated between 5% and 50% annualized of the net management fee of the respective investment products on assets raised serviced by Flex Networks. Flex Networks is not a client of any of the investment advisors promoted herein.